Pozdravljeni. Torej, imenujem Motovila pozdravljeni na drugem spletnem pogovoru v ciklu Plan B za kulturne politike evropskih mest, ki ga organiziramo v sodelovanju z mestno občino Ljubljana in kot del programa srečanja mednarodne mreže AITM. Torej, današnji pogovor bo potekal v angliškem jeziku and I'll switch to English now. So, hello and welcome to the second online discussion within the Plan B series organized by Motovila Institute in cooperation with Municipality of Ljubljana and in partnership with Creative Eurodes Lithuania and Croatia. This discussion is also part of the multi-location plenary meeting 2020 organized by ITM, International Network for Contemporary Performing Arts. This meeting, uh, actually this is the first meeting, multi-location meeting taking place today and tomorrow online and live in more than 20 different locations around the world. But before we start, I would like to briefly present Motovila. So our main goal is promotion of transnational and cross-sectoral cooperation in the cultural and creative sectors. Core of our activity is also running Creative Europe Desk, national contact point for EU Creative Europe program. We strive to provide a complete support service for the cultural and creative sector. We also mediate between the sector and decision makers, especially in disseminating good practices and innovative initiatives. We believe that also today's discussion will contribute to this goal. In June, as you remember, we talked with guests from Lisbon, Novi Sad and Ljubljana, what was the first reaction of these cities in order to support the sector during the pandemic. Today's focus is a relation between culture and space. Uh, today we host representatives from Rijeka, Kaunas and Ljubljana. I would like to welcome uh, Irena Kregar Šegota. She's director of Rijeka 2020, European Capital of Culture. And we have another representative from the Capital of Culture candidate, uh, candidate um, city, or not candidate, but already <laughs> confirmed city, uh, Anna Kočergova, head of program at Kaunas 20, uh, 2022. And from Ljubljana, we have Nevenka Koprivšek, Artistic Director of Bunker Institute and Mladi Levi International Festival of Performing Arts. And now I will slowly pass the floor to our moderator, Ragnar Sil, International Cultural Policy Expert and also Director of Creativity Lab. But just, just before we start, a short technical instruction. Your microphones are already muted uh, during the event and you can ask questions via chat option. Uh, when doing so, please introduce yourself and uh, put your name of the organization and Ragnar or I will read your questions and comments during and or after the discussion so that panelists can answer the questions. And Ragnar, the floor is yours, so you may start. Thank you. Wonderful. Welcome to everyone. We have 83 attendees already and counting. Um, and I'm so honored uh, to be chairing uh, such a, a wonderful panel today. Uh, well, greetings, first of all, from far, far away from the north, uh, from Tallinn, Estonia. It's almost snowing here. We're close to Santa Claus. So soon the winter is coming. And I don't know if it's reference to a second wave of the coronavirus or the, the actual winter. Um, we are going to have, uh, uh, hopefully, a very open, uh, very honest, very direct um, and very free exchange of ideas here, not too much formality. I promise this uh, discussion today will be much better than the US presidential debate we just witnessed. I promised we're going to be intelligent and civilized. So. Without further ado, I'm, I, I'm happy to um, uh, dive into our today's topic, which is a relationship between culture and space. Something that has been um, in the very heart of the culture policy discussion um, for many, many years. Uh, but I think it's even more important now. Um, as, uh, as Ines mentioned, we, uh, we were discussing the impacts of the virus um, uh, uh, some months ago in our previous discussion. Uh, everybody hoped that this is something that will pass uh, rather quickly and that we will not find ourselves 
uh, in the situation we have found ourselves now with a new uh, wave uh, coming and new concerns uh, uh, related to uh, different lockdowns and restrictions. The, that will also lead us to the question of, of what is a safe space in the months and years to come. Uh, what do we have to take into account when we think about the spaces of the future, when we think about how to organize events and how to convene people, how to manage and balance uh, uh, the culture between digital and physical um, uh, domains? And, how, and, and in these times of crisis, when everything seems so unpredictable, how will we make sure that those cultural spaces we've created and we've invested in will remain economically viable as well? We are going to go to different cities uh, and look at different good uh, practices that cities have taken. Uh, and also we are open to hear uh, uh, examples from uh, our audience as well. We start with, uh, uh, with Rijeka, the current uh, uh, capital of European capital of culture. Um, we're going to talk to the director, Irena Gregor Shegota. Irena is with us. Uh, we last time uh, uh, talking about cities and COVID, we, we, we said we couldn't imagine the challenges that uh, Rijeka uh, must face with, together with Galway, the, the Irish uh, European capital of culture, um, with you having made your preparations for years for this, uh, for this special year, and then everything changed so quickly, so rapidly, and so unexpectedly. So I would like to give the floor for you uh, for the first introduction. Irena, please. Well, really, I'm very happy to be here uh, in this wonderful company, uh, wonderful hosts. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this uh, talk and for inviting the ECA, giving us opportunity to, to share our experiences. Also, big welcome to uh, everybody who's listening to us and joining in this debate. Uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, yes, um, uh, European Capital of Culture, in a way, is an extreme project, if I may use that word. And uh, But we never dreamed that we would be uh, facing such extreme circumstances that we are now. Um, it has taken many years uh, to prepare this project. Uh, we were designated in 2016. And uh, but the preparation started in 2013, so it's been uh, seven years now. It's very difficult what you prepare for so many years with so many partners, uh, so many dreams uh, to be poetic, and then you are forced, uh, of course, like everybody else, to to change uh, and to adapt uh, basically overnight. But uh, I think adaptability uh, and flexibility is a really key word in this situation for all of us. So that's also what we did. So as I said, uh, a big project that we prepared for many years. Uh, in short, we planned uh, for 2020 more than 600 events with 250 partners from 40 countries around the world. Uh, the beginning was wonderful, a uh, spectacular opening uh, in the port uh, with big uh, opera industriale, uh, which gathered more than 30,000 people, uh, 30,000 people around the world uh, in, uh, in the audience on the streets uh, uh, of Rijeka. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, the uh, uh, first couple of months were great. Uh, besides the opening, we had uh, other events and then uh, everything uh, stopped in March. So when I wave my, my pen, it, it's a signal that we can move on. Yeah, what happened? Happened Corona and uh, the COVID situation. And all of a sudden uh, we were faced with, uh, first of all, impossibility uh, to do our project. It was very uh, clear very soon that we need to reorganize, restructure and reprogram. So just in a few bullets, I'm going to describe what were our new goals. We, we decided that our reprogramming should focus, first of all, on, of course, things that physically we can do, that we can physically uh, implement. Uh, we decided to focus on physical implementations, 
um, artistic interventions, uh, sculptures in public space, or things that are going to last uh, after 2020, on other legacy projects, on our festivals, and finally on uh, programs that have strong community and participation moment. Because many foreign artists were not able to join us, we also uh, heavily uh, rely on, on our public, uh, on our local and national uh, cultural and artistic scene. Uh, I mean, or in every country around the world, the artistic and cultural sector were really uh, um, shocked and really damaged by this whole situation and we also felt that it was our obligation to this project to help uh, scene uh, and, and, uh, and the artists, especially the independent artists and independent organization. So let me just give you an example of what we did. Luckily, we we uh, we had wonderful weather in Croatia, wonderful weather in Rijeka, so we decided to squeeze as many uh, projects uh, during summer months, and we basically decided to use whatever space uh, is available outside for, for, for the happening of our programs. This is, for example, one of the beaches where uh, uh, public, uh, where, when a contemporary art installations uh, was, uh, was erected. You can al already see that although we are outside, uh, there are uh, people are, are keeping distances, there are certain rules. This is an example of a new ch uh, kids playground that was erected on a long, uh, pier that runs in the center of the city. Uh, another example of uh, an intervention in a public space, uh, again, the, uh, the children's uh, playground. Uh, other buildings that are very uh, frequented by uh, and used, this is a fish market in the center of Rijeka, was again used for uh, for another artistic installation by Czech artist um, uh, Pavel Merkush, uh, you can see if you, if you take a no, if, if you take a look at the at the uh, ground floor, you can see the the transparent uh, plexiglass borders that are surrounding women who uh, who sell fish. And then on the gallery, uh, we are having this uh, this event and opening of the uh, of the installation. Uh, performing arts are and big festival are of course uh, uh, examples of the programs that were particularly in jeopardy. This is a picture from last year from our festival Tobogan, Children's Festival Tobogan, that gathered uh, 8,000 people on the streets on Rijeka. This is the same square this year. Something like that was not possible, but nevertheless, we decided to to do the festival. The same square this year received 500 people. You can see that we had to use barriers to physically uh, divide the audience. Uh, our staff is protected. We are distributing uh, disinfectants and also we have to register every single person and take the contacts, uh, every single uh, person who is, who is participating in the, in the event. Uh, we cannot see it clearly on this photo, but this man with his kid is actually sitting on one of the crosses that is uh, uh, glued to, uh, to, to, to the floor, uh, marking the place or the per perimeter where audience can, uh, can stay. Uh, nevertheless, the, the festival was, uh, was wonderful. Uh, everybody had a lot of fun. Uh, with kids, of course, it's very difficult to to to, to keep distances, and but uh, uh, we were happy in the end that that this thing happened. As I said last year, we had 5,000, 8,000 people. This year, only a couple of hundred people. What we also did instead of gathering of uh, uh, gathering everybody at one place at one square, we distributed events around the city so that we had a number of uh, uh, workshops, uh, ateliers for, kid, uh, for children, uh, all uh, outside. This is a different example. So uh, anything in the city can be turned into a canvas for, for, so to say, for, for creativity and for expression. 
Uh, we even use this this particular program happened on a top terrace of a, a one of the biggest shopping malls in in Rijeka. So any public space uh, became became theater in this uh, in this um, in this case. Um, we have a whole program line where we invited our citizens to propose uh, their programs and they also participated in the choice of, uh, of, uh, of programs that are going to be financed and implemented. This is one of them and uh, uh, at the end during COVID they decided to have this program on top of their skyscraper. Uh, so basically the situation forced them to be very inventive and to move from a hole that they have in their building to the top uh, open space. And I'm sure that created new conversations, new views of the city, and maybe new new ideas for, 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 the, for the future programs. Uh, another example of citizens' intervention, they decided to, uh, to we decided to install uh, wooden pavilions that were afterwards also decorated with uh, with different uh, uh, plants and greenery, and they became a popular spaces for intimate uh, gatherings, intimate uh, encounters in uh, in larger uh, public spaces. But uh, now, uh, since larger groups are not possible, still some tete-a-tete -tete conversations can uh, still go on. Uh, a lot of tours around the city, walks, uh, but as I said, we really try to move everything, everything uh, uh, outside. Uh, yeah, another example of, a, of an event, uh, even seating arrangements have to be different, so the settings are different. Not, not, it's not just that programs are adapting, but also uh, the arrangement of the uh, audiences need to be adapted to the new uh, situation. Uh, this is another example from, so many programs are happening, not just in Rijeka, but also in the surrounding villages, even there in woods, so to say, uh, we had to apply different rules uh, for, for the audience and to adapt the programs for, for the situation. But also this uh, new program, uh, this new situation and new circumstances uh, opened uh, uh, space for projects like this that are very intimate and that are meant for uh, almost individual meditative uh, visits uh, that that are possible possible now. Uh, a cinema festival, of course, that was uh, meant to happen in our art cinema, it has been also was uh, taken uh, taken outside uh, this summer. Another example of, of a new circus performance uh, from France. This is one of the rare artist that uh, who was able to come to Rijeka this summer. We were very happy that uh, uh, his performance took place and also we moved uh, this performance from uh, a theater space to, uh, to, to the port, to, to outside, outside uh, venue. Uh, audience is very adaptable, you know, that everybody accepts now to be standing, to be sitting on the floor, to uh, to be patient, to, you know, take distance, uh, to do whatever they want. But in the end, uh, everybody's also happy to be participating in these moments uh, that are still remain the moments of, of, of sharing that cannot happen elsewhere, like in a physical uh, space. Besides uh, outdoor open air spaces, uh, a lot of program happened in this former warehouse in the port that was transform transformed uh, very quickly um, in a new uh, cultural space in the city. For the moment, it's planned as a pop-up space, but I think it's it's worked so wonderfully that I think that even after this situation and after 2020, it will remain as a new space. We are discovering uh, through this example, uh, new ways of merging programs of 
uh, having different type of events in the same space and we are also using the space in front you can see in front of the building and that now we will see the examples inside of the building this is uh, so all summer long we had concerts and different events outside but also inside uh, we were able to do two major uh, exhibitions uh, one dedicated to the history of art and the other one this the other uh, images from uh, glowing sea exhibition created by Inke Arns. I mean you can see everybody is in masks we basically uh, open slots for groups of people so the, that the uh, visitors pre-schedule for for the visits uh, we are, of course, regularly monitored by public services or health uh, uh, patrols, so to say, COVID patrols who really take care that are, uh, they are making sure that there are no, uh, that we um, really uh, uh, respect the measures in, uh, that, are, that are enforced. You can see how large the space it is. Uh, this blue chair actually is, uh, um, and uh, um, inter artistic intervention by Slovenian uh, author Sasha Zlacek, uh, Lazy Chair. Uh, but the space is huge. So as I said, uh, it enabled different programs different in different time slots, very interesting merging, even merging of different audiences, audience that would normally never go to a contemporary art exhibition, but to another his historical exhibition now took a peek and took interest in other programs because they were happening in the same space and also there were uh, anima animators and our people who invited them to, to, to do so. So it's a, also very interesting uh, uh, work uh, in, in audience development. These are examples of programs uh, in the same, uh, in the same uh, space, uh, uh, historical machines, uh, Bill Warren. Now I'm moving to a completely different space. It's a national theater um, that normally seats 500 people. Uh, now we are allowed to have 150 uh, to 200 uh, um, uh, people in the in the in the in the audience, which really uh, brings us to question of economical viability. We can talk about that uh, afterwards. But even with the theater, we decided to be inventive. Uh, this is a picture from the Mahler's uh, Second Symphony that took place uh, last week. Originally, it was meant for 200 performers, and we decided that we cannot just uh, downsize that and took the strength uh, out of that number of performers on stage. So we moved the whole evening to a big sports hall. Of course, the acoustics, uh, honestly, was not the same, but nevertheless, um, the, the, the event uh, uh, happened. And finally, an example of digital, of course, that uh, many things are happening digital. Um, there is a whole discussion around digital, and it's not so easy to move digital overnight. If you want to do a real digital art, it takes time and uh, uh, different skills and different type of creativity. Uh, and uh, uh, it's really, I, I mean, of course, I'm sure we will talk about that more. But um, one of our program lines is called 27 Neighborhoods. And each of the neighborhoods in Rijeka and in our region were connected with one of the neighborhoods in each European country. Of course, that uh, for this year, we planned uh, a number of visits, exchanges that was not, uh, that was not possible. But uh, for example, uh, this project is done with uh, Collective Hoge Fronten from the Netherlands. And then they did an online uh, a program with the local artists and a 360 tour of the of the neighborhood that they will they uh, they are uh, cooperating uh, in uh, within the ECA 2020. Um, yeah, and finally, just one sentence about the other part of our project 
program uh, pro of uh, Rijeka 2020 is, of course, big infrastructural project, uh, renovation of a former industrial complex. And here we do not have delays. The works are going on, but this is, uh, and most of the buildings will be open this year as planned, but this is a, 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 another topic. So from my side, for introduction, these were um, uh, examples of how we adapted to the situation, how we used and different spaces, basically whole city, uh, any corner, any every square, uh, every uh, terrace, uh, top terrace can become a stage for our programs. Uh, the key uh, for us was uh, uh, adaptability, flexibility. We were helped by nice weather, that's true. Uh, but certainly, uh, I think the main question is our relation to the audience and uh, uh, in terms of accessibility uh, of the programs and in terms of how we are working with our audience in this new circumstances. And I think that a lot of good will come out of that. And just one uh, question um, around economic viability. Of course, that the KPIs that were valid before the COVID are no longer standing anywhere in the world. But this also has to do with the audience and their accessibility. I mean, um, if we are we if we are doing uh, uh, programs, uh, just keeping in mind the number of uh, sold tickets, or uh, you know, if we can cover. Uh, our expenses from the audience that's I don't think it's going to be viable anymore and uh, more than ever um, it has been shown that uh, culture really uh, has to be helped by public finances uh, that it relies heavily on on public policies and that we must not uh, uh, disregard that and really um, be be stopped by by economic reasoning or be be uh, yeah so uh, definitely different kind of of values and of of uh, of uh, uh, milestones uh, should should be defined and maybe this whole situation not maybe but I'm certain that it will force us uh, into uh, another kind of uh, uh, different reflections and uh, different kind uh, uh, conclusions. Yeah, thank you. Hvala, hvala, Irena. Um, I mean, you, you said you are helped with the good weather. You In Croatia, you are blessed with the good weather. In my country, we only have two kinds of weather. It's a good skiing weather and a bad skiing weather, nothing more. I, I wouldn't imagine how we could survive in your place. Um, and you mentioned uh, uh, very positive things uh, that come out of this uh, nearly impossible situation. I think you, you, the, what you showed us, the, the, what you, how you framed our discussions with with different ways, how you how you cope with all these restrictions and limitations is a very good example. Uh, uh, some of our uh, uh, listeners have also pointed out that it has brought up also some good uh, good points, uh, uh, saying that that these kind of limitations uh, also have allowed us to be closer to ourselves and achieve an honest closeness with others. Very beautifully said. Um, uh, you also mentioned the impact on the economics, the viabil economic viability, that yes, in this uh, short time period, let's say, as a part of European capital of culture, you could manage, but if this would now go on for, for a longer period of time, then with these reduced uh, audiences, it would be very difficult to imagine the similar business models or operational models to continue. So that's also a very, very important thing. But I just wanted to uh, ask you uh, 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 just a follow-up quickly, um, that 
could you also point out some some of the negative aspects not only in terms of the, uh, the, the difficulties in terms of managing the restrictions, uh, nor the economic uh, uh, KPIs, as you mentioned, but also in terms of the very artistic program itself. Uh, as you are aware, um, the studies, for example, the one made in June by uh, this year by Nesta, has pointed out the widening uh, a gap uh, because of the digital, uh, the amount of digital um, uh, uh, culture uh, and this being more uh, uh, open for the, let's say, privileged social groups, meaning that with re reduced, uh, 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 reduced uh, audiences and more focus on digital um, means of uh, cultural participation, we've actually limited, or let's say the culture uh, life has has uh, um, is not as accessible to all those groups that we wanted to reach um, with our uh, European Capital of Culture programs. How do you how do you cope with that side um, of the COVID uh, crisis, Irena? Yeah, definitely. I mentioned accessibility in in different terms. You know, you're you're definitely right, um, and th that's a big question. You know, how we bring uh, how we bring culture to uh to as many people you know uh as possible uh in let's take a theater for for example we tried to uh to do more shows for you know so, so in less of one uh, performance for 500 people to do uh, four performances for uh, 100 people but that's you know uh, again, we are we are uh, running into the wall of e economic question. Uh, so yeah, that's a that's a thing to be uh, to be really uh, to be resolved, and we, we need to find answers. But I would like to point to another another point which is very important, and that is the international dimension of our projects. Uh, European Capital Culture, of course, one of the main criteria when we are evaluated as bidding cities is the European dimension, so-called European dimension, and that is that means with how many, uh, how many, you know, not just how many, but how diverse, how different uh, uh, partners we are, we are co-creating, we are, we are co-producing, uh, how we are reaching the European audiences. And during this year, only I would say that only 10% of our our, uh, our dear guests and dear friends from uh, from abroad were able to to come to Rijeka. Performing arts are uh, are in most difficult situation, as I said before. You know, we were able to do exhibitions that were curated uh, works. We managed to bring works to Croatia, and that was difficult. You know border problems, uh, delays, etc. But that was somehow uh, possible. But physical, you know, people coming here, co-creating, performing with us, that's a problem. And there is a, a big problem and also the, the thing that we are all relying and investing more in our national and local uh, artists and cultural scene. This, in a way, uh, presents a danger that we are closing up, you know, and the uh, culture, uh, cultural arena is one of the arenas that should be open. It's, uh, you know, absolutely open for, uh, for dialogue, for, for, for contact, for co-creation, for different kinds of, of uh, uh, mutual influences and dialogues. Uh, without that, um, um, yeah. The, 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 we must find ways. Can digital uh, replace that? To a certain extent, you know, I mean, uh, we are having this conference, so we are uh, cooperating, we, we are having this dialogue, but I, I would love to, to have this dialogue in Rijeka so that I can take you around, uh, so that you can taste and smell and touch my city, you know, uh, allow me to be poetic. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but of course, adaptability. You know, that's uh, that's uh, that's the key. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's uh, it's absolutely true that this crisis, with its positive effects, have really pushed the creatives to think outside of the box. And uh, and anyone who's been in the European Capital of Culture movement for many years uh, knows this big challenge of 
actually getting the candidates and getting the selected cities to move away from these huge, flashy, big events, a festival-based create uh, culture capitals into more intimate, more impactful, more creative solutions. And I think if if the crisis have done something good, I think this this change has now been accelerated. We will come back to these topics. Now we go back to Slovenia. We have Nevenka Koprivšek, uh, who is an artistic director of uh, Bunker Institute and also uh, um, Mladievi International Festival of Performing Arts. Uh, uh, Nevenka, uh, uh, I already know that you have a very um, a wide uh, perspective on, on, the, on the impact of crisis, culture and spaces, especially in Slovenian context. Um, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ragnar, and thank you very much, Mutuvila, to invite me and to share a little bit of our experience with you. And it's true, I would like to take it a little bit into a larger context, especially from Slovenian context, which, uh, of course, like everybody else, we are living these really challenging times. And... Uh, as Bruno Latour would say that we are only at the beginning of a learning curve, how to, what Irina was saying, to, to adapt. To ex I think we, we need a lot of experimentation and trying out. We don't know what the future will bring us, and we definitely are at, the, at this very start, how to not only adapt, but also to see what is, what, um, what is possible. But if we talk about context of a public space or a pub, what is public and common, uh, which um, is a little bit also at the core of our discussion, uh, let me share you that Slovene, the, when the lockdown in Slovenia has started, it collided with another shift in our society, which was, let's say, for a long time, more or less, with certain gaps, more or less, say, Mm, centralist left shifted very much to the right. We could almost say to the extreme right, which meant that at the same time the public space became a kind of um, field of a fight. All well, the public space was suddenly full with politics or COVID situation. So the the so it's the. Let's say the, there was a lot of uh, protests and a lot of initiatives coming from the balconies to the street with bicycles. And it is now, I think, 25th week in a row that people are really protesting against the measures, which actually also just recently we learned also um, attacked, let's say, the culture or or the, everything which is more or less critical to the society. Uh, so the, in, in the new measurements of the government, we just learned that, the, I mean, we learned we kind of, uh, that the, the, the rebalance of the national budgets will uh, raise most of the domains, but culture and science, which is very, um, again, a very kind of lacmus paper of what is going on, um, which is, again, fight over the public domain or, pub, or public uh, around media, etc. But I will, I will share a few, since these protests are also had a very artistic connotation, maybe later if we have time I would like to share some photos, uh, because it is a real drama going on on the street somehow, um, without trying to aestheticize, of course, the, let's say, small revolutions. But um, if we go back a little, if I go a little bit through what we experienced in Bunker, how we kind of reacted to these challenges, of course, uh, everything we thought to do in February, we just had to throw over the window and say, how, how should we proceed? In, uh, in March or in April, it looked completely impossible to do a festival in the summer or to produce or to present. It looked, everybody, we have seen how many festivals just renounced or had to close down um, their programs. So we started, but we said, let's pretend that it might be possible. So we were actually, we kept all the artists we have been engaged with more or less 
uh, in communication. But we decided to, let's say, if we talk about Mladi Levi Festival, which always happens end of August, we have, instead of doing bigger events, let's say with a lot of people, we kind of split activities a little bit like Irina, Irina told in Rijeka. It's this very similar situation. We split them in a smaller com smaller events all around our neighborhood. But I must say that um, that although it has lost this kind of momentum which festivals are, which to come together to celebrate art, etc., it had a really very nice atmosphere here and then and there. Another thing we did uh, is together with our other colleagues from the city, we started to work on, on open air theater. And uh, this has also brought us to, let's say, new ways of collaborating, also very different organizations, public NGOs, from Puppet Theater to Glade Theater, which is also co-hosting this event, to Mladinsko Theater, which is also a repertory uh, theater, to us, to Cinemateca, to amateurs, and to, to the people doing the music. And all together, we created kind of pop-up program over the two months in you know, open air uh, space, uh, surrounded by museums who for this occasion also stayed open very late in the evening. So it made kind of mishmash of different things, very eclectic program, but very, uh, let's say, in the city, I must say, really strongly supported these uh, activities with providing some resources to, to for the equipment for the and really and they really were listening to us, and I think also the audience because you you could have children's programs which also have been stuck in their apartments for such a long time to the to the amateur thing to the really hardcore let's say more contemporary art stuff. Another thing that the bunker did was really much we have been thinking of how to how to respond to the to the needs of the artist in a different way. We knew that we won't be able to help everybody or to support everybody, but nevertheless we are a little bit um, a privileged situation because we are program funded, although the NGO we are we have program funds, and so we changed some of our program and we uh, actually invited 11 artists uh, just during the COVID time just to think of the, their projects and we paid for that. So the, already it's difficult for the artists to stay at home, not to be able, not to have the future, let's say, or not to know what the future will bring. But they said, let's, let's really invest into thinking time. And we, we came up with 11 proposals. Uh, and some of them we realize during the festival, some we will, and for some we look other partners in, in, in our larger collectivities co -pro, co -pro, co -pro, to co-produce in the future. And this was something which I found changed also us the way we function a little bit. Uh, and we did it also more collectively. I mean, Bunker, we never had this kind of pyramidal structure. We always, we are sharing responsibility a lot, but this time really we, programmed very much collectively in a very organic way. So I think that all this time, maybe just, this is just an example also to, to show how these times can also change us as institutions, as producers, etc. And here, um, because let's, let's admit that our institutions are very rigid, including, including public or private and uh, let's say in this time of this challenging time and with all these public means that we actually still do have how can we share that we that people we want to touch not just come and buy the tickets and but also how we can make something which would be more that we are all part of the same community who actually aspire to let's say another present and future let's say um, here I would like to give you an example, and this I, I, I call that kind of open institutions, and as an example of open institutions, I would like just to present you just uh, with few words, because last year in the frame of one uh, 
project, uh, European project. I had the chance to visit Sardinia and interviewed some, uh, let's say, the director of uh, Teatro Massimo, Massimo Mancini, and he explained me how they already, they have been changing already before COVID time into something much more open. Let's say every Friday they open their theater, their big theater, so open their theater and venue to the homeless people without obliging them to see their programs and not forcing them. It's not about new audience building, but it's really about sharing spaces. Another thing that they do, for example, where all the theaters we have, let's say, our vitrine on showing publicity of our programs, they invited the local television to, and they share programs with them. And they can talk about arts, daily life or sports. Another thing they did is really they, they work on the streets of Cagliari to work with really this privileged situation with their knowledge and especially with young girls who get pregnant very uh, young and their children are taken away, etc. Um, they, they share their knowledge and their ability to, to let's say, to cut the traditional stuff and to also aspire to provide some changes. Not only that, but also they are involved in a project called Sardex, which is a Sardinian money, which with which they share, let's say, rest, but this you can go to the restaurant or the theater. So they, they think about new economies also, how to connect arts and cultural institutions into, let's say, sort of new economy when we talk economic impact. So how to avoid this big corporational stuff and big, uh, big um, you know, bank profiting, etc. So I think this is very interesting case of open institution, which would be difficult to imagine our city theaters to open theaters like that, at least in, in the cases I know around. Another, and we have also uh, something similar going here. It's our colleagues in our neighborhood, which is a sports center tabor, who also, let's, let's say during this summer, opened we, it, it is a long process of, of course, of our involvement in the neighborhoods, like before I was talking about the museums and other theaters, but this time it is a sports theater, sports center who opens the door and offers their capacity, uh, let's say, in, in, we had performances in, we had discussions in their garden, in their courtyard, there were, there, there were, there were, there have been artistic programs, performances, exhibition, the other people playing basket in, in the, in the background and everything, and all these kind of cohabitated in the same space. And this is something that that I believe is maybe one of the one of the possibilities for the future also. That how we can make a little bit, how we can think a little bit more collectively what kind of world we would like to to live in. Which traditionally we know that from, if I go a little bit back historically, after the Second World War, I mean, in Yugoslavia, there was a big, I don't know, revolution, you know, belief, and people were collectively building streets and railways, etc. And of course, in the 90s, this is, of course, also uh, because of the another war, etc., and it happened in the region, another huge crisis but also a lot of privatization and individualistic approach to how to live in this society. So I think now maybe we have another turn. We are in a lot of turning point that to use, let's say, this crisis to think a little bit how to, to, how to, to live in the future. And to the end, maybe what would be the city's role in this? I think this, the, it is, uh, the role of the cities is very important in these challenges in, because I believe that a lot of, not just here, but um, a lot of in Eastern Europe, but not just Eastern Europe, the governments are becoming much more hermetic, nationalistic, etc. So I think the, the role of the cities is even more important uh, and more, um, um, let's say, yeah, more important. And, and uh, recently I've, I've read actually that you have a kind of anti Visegrad uh, uh, coalition of some cities from Poland, uh, uh, Czech Republic, uh, Budapest is in also to fight against uh, the nationalism and fascism. And also they, they're asking commission to actually get some direct funds. 
I'm not sure that this avoiding this redistribution, which is has was working on another values, but I'm not sure if they can be so successful in that. But at least this coalition of the cities could be, I think, in my opinion, also very interesting. And well, I think this is it for the moment. And uh, can I follow up quickly as well? Yes. Levenka, thank you. You 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 mentioned. Uh, uh, the fact that organizations in general are very rigid uh, um, yeah. and, uh, and uh, this has been very challenging for them uh, uh, mostly to cope with this new situation. Last time as well we discussed a lot about the organization resilience uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as, as a form of you know, people, um, uh, organizations uh, 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 looking at crises often in a way that you, know, you put your, your head under the sand and you hope the storm goes away so mm -hmm. you can bounce back. Uh, but often uh, the storm has changed the landscape so much that there is nowhere to go back. So instead of going bouncing back, you need to really bounce further uh, uh, or forward. Um, uh, so my question to you rather is, do you think uh, we will see those impacts that you, um, you described or at least you hoped for, that they are rather short term uh, only as long as things go back, back uh, uh, business as uh, normal, business as usual, or rather you think that some of those changes will be as fundamental that they will remain, and if so, what will those, those uh, uh, fundamental changes be, and how would they impact the way we understand culture, cultural policy and, and, and space? I wish I knew, I don't, <laughs> but uh, I can, for sure, uh, we cannot just go back to the business as usual. This is, I think this has become very clear for everybody. I mean, even if we just look for a year on or two ahead, we know we have reduced audiences, uh, economic, you, you have been mentioning before with Irena, also what does it mean? And big institutions, even like Cirque du Soleil are falling apart, who have been really working very successfully on the market, let's say, art market. So this is not, for, for, for sure, for a while, it's not possible. But I think we have to think a little bit larger than that. We don't know what the future will bring. As I'm saying that we are at the beginning of learning and our role is to experiment, to test different options. We cannot, I don't think we know what the future will bring. And, and it is what we adopted is that we plan almost from day to day. Bunker, we are very, let's say, good students. We always like to plan in advance. We, we like to be prepared and we run the venue, we run the festival. And of course, we are also adaptable, but to be adaptable to this point, it's almost, uh, it's quite, uh, but I, we are all in the same Huh. I wanted to say we are all in the same boat, but in fact, let's be, <laughs> we are not. We are not in the same boat. And this is also something which is the, the very present now. I will just, um, that inequalities are, I mean, all this COVID time just deepened all imbalances, which have already been, been there. In that sense, it's equal than before. Just, just this inequality, these gaps became just bigger and bigger not if i just i don't know i can quote the french Vahe who just wrote me a few days ago from armenia i mean can you imagine what are they and he's really appealing to to, to support of a national community because they're facing the war all that we don't know we don't know this the effect of not traveling so much i don't know i have another friend who, who is in poland right now she said we don't know what is happening in poland also, people are, are on the streets, they're protesting, they want some changes different than they're happening now. But we are now a little bit, <laughs> so we will have to travel again. I hope we will be traveling again. In spite of the ecological impact, uh, we need, and what another statement, what at least we would like to insist is in this direct contact with the audience. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is this la last point that you were also talking about is about this all everything online in with our festival and what we do we insist in the to what Miller I would say fetish of this direct exchange. Otherwise we would start to do movies or videos or or 
it was of course fantastic that the, all the uh, archives has been opened, so we could see performances of Pina Bausch, Wooster Group, everything which is historically so important for the development of contemporary arts now is online. But again, we have a questions of water's rights, etc., cetera, et cetera. But what is true that it is reaching more audiences. This is true. But do we feel more part of the society for that? I don't know. Very good. Uh, and, and I might just add that it's not just about not being able to travel, but that also that everybody is so concerned with their own local issues. That exactly, it's exactly. There, exactly. Just not having the time to really focus on other things as well, and it will have an uh, impact it already has. And the, the last thing, Nevenka, you mentioned mm -hmm. that uh, it's so true, and actually one of our li uh, uh, listeners uh, today, uh, Björn, uh, has asked this, so I will ask this question, but I will not ask you to answer right now, uh, Nevenka, Irena, I, I give you some time to prepare, so we come back to this question after Anna, but the question is very irrelevant, uh, and just to the point you made. Um, Björn uh, notices uh, or mentions that uh, you all, the speakers, uh, uh, put particular attention to creative solutions, to maintaining the, 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 really the, the physical connection with the audiences and the celebratory aspect of arts and culture. Um, COVID-19 challenges have forced us to think creatively on seating arrangement and digital meetings and so on. And Björn is asking, what are the three main points to take away from your experience uh, to secure the collective experience? But I will come back to this collective, physical, real-time uh, experiences and, and the importance of that after we, uh, we come actually closer to my own home. We, we come to Lithuania, to uh, uh, Kaunas, uh, the future capital of culture of Europe, 2022. 20, uh, and we are going to talk with head of program, uh, Anna Kochegarova. Um, Anna, the floor is yours. Uh, I, I mean, you have a, a slightly more time to prepare for the, for, uh, for the impact and chaos uh, uh, caused by COVID, uh, but it also puts a more, uh, 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 more responsibility on your cho shoulders because at least Irena can say, you know, you know, we didn't have time or, uh, you know, we gave our best, but at least you have an, a year or, or uh, one and a half years uh, to prepare. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, again, Motavila, and uh, for the invitation. Pleasure to be uh, in all of your company. Uh, thank you for the positive note, Ragnar. <laughs> we do have time, on the other hand, not so much. I, uh, I'm sharing with you a presentation, and I hope that uh, everyone can see because I decided to, to, yeah, to use a few illustrations um, to help me uh, talk about you know, our perspective, our experience of the pandemic time and where it brought us, what topics it raised. So let's see if it's working. It is. I will start uh, you know, by overviewing a few of our initiatives and not only our initiatives, but also uh, uh, events and um, actions that took place during the pandemic time in Kaunas. Then in the second part, I will go to a little more um, global or you know, more broader local context to, to talk about the topics that um, you know, the pandemic time and our entrance into the public space uh, inspired and then maybe a few more reflections on the online a shift to the online so anyway the pandemic started in march in our case march 16th and you know in our program konas european capital of culture program one of our um, main um, values is the uh, co-creation and connection with the locals so we, we have a huge program of community culture, um, the goal of which is to kind of um, encourage the communities to, to join, to act, to take responsibility for their space, to take responsibility for the way they interact with each other. And uh, when the pandemic started, we didn't have any kind of connection with these people anymore. So we decided to create a new initiative that was called Culture to the Courtyards. So we were bringing, um, uh, as you could see in this video, we were bringing a different artist um, uh, to perform 
in uh, uh, courtyards of the residential uh, block houses. Uh, the, the neighbors could watch these performances from their balconies without interacting with each other physically. This initiative was uh, very well accepted by the public, by the citizens. The national TV was transmitting these, you know, broadcasting these live. And the city government also enjoyed this approach. And uh, we were asked to uh, suggest an idea for the annual Kona City celebration, you know, how we can celebrate it in May when the you know, virus situation is still uh, bad. So we uh, made this program, Culture to the Courtyards, even larger, inviting different Kona-based culture institutions to create performances in the courtyards. And then after that, um, we invited restaurants of Kona uh, city center based uh, restaurants to um, merge into one big table because the restaurants legally they could operate during that time so we were not uh, kind of abandoning the rules but we in fact created a big party on our main pedestrian avenue here you can see that uh, where citizens could enjoy a, uh, a common dinner let's say uh, by keeping uh, keeping to the law, you know. So uh, also in May, uh, we hosted the European Capital of Culture Forum, which is an annual event, event, very international. Of course, the main value, let's say, the people bring out from this uh, event is the networking, so connections with other people. But of course, this time this was moved online i'd say the value of this uh, move to the online was you know reaching out to a more global and broader public on the other side of course we are losing this uh, physical connection and uh, well possibility to network in a more effective way uh, we've also made a few other community-oriented initiatives, like, for example, Windows of uh, the Quarantine. Uh, it was an initiative of an independent artist, Gabi and Monica Weinuta. Uh, we supported this action in Konas, and she portrayed uh, in her photographs the portraits of the people in quarantine. You know, people, uh, the uh, different um, culture institutions um, were kind of inspired to move. They missed the audiences. They would, so all of us moved to the public space. This is an example. I'm sorry for a bad quality picture. Example of a concert um, organization of Konas uh, and their uh, orchestra, Ajolinas, who started to perform live concerts in uh, one of the central parks regularly each weekend um, this never happened before in this um, uh, time in august uh, and during this pandemic time we also uh, run the festival contempo which is performing arts festival and uh, one of the main artistic directions of this festival is uh, you know um, uh, looking for connection with the city spaces so uh, discovering new spaces or new perspective on the city spaces through performing arts and uh, this time we we experimented with the public spaces quite a lot it, it brought a very new a fresh look onto the city uh, but also some online projects as well so uh, this is a picture from and a performance it was broadcasted from our office so actors are sitting in the office and they are playing in this online play, which was broadcasted online. The um, uh, other artists, other artistic groups uh, um, you know, participating in this festival were using courtyards. This piece was specially created also. It was a premiere of uh, young, young theater creators about their memories of, the, of their childhood in the courtyards was performed in a courtyard. We discovered parking uh, spaces, which uh, related very much to, you know, with the theater play, which was uh, shown here. Uh, you know, public art, often you have to make exceptions for, for artists and it might even stop, uh, stop the traffic sometimes. Okay, the topics, um, next I would like to move from our examples to the topics that I bumped into during this uh, pandemic time. And here I'm going to talk about examples, not only from Kona's, uh, but first of all, 
you know, about um, the topic about who uses, you know, who decides about how we use the public space. And when you go into the public space, you are, uh, you know, in the center of different interest uh, interests, and you you have to uh, relate to different interest groups. Uh, this example I want to show is from Lukashka Square in Vilnius. Uh, the main um, representational um, square, um, very important for as a memory, you know, as a symbol in Lithuanian memory. Uh, this this square used to be the place of the Lenin statue, of course, in 1992, I think it was, of course demolished and today we have a conflict of interest how it should look like you know uh, some people imagine it should be uh, it should look uh, something like that you know uh, the uh, winning project for the reconstruction was uh, opposite from this what you see um, but also didn't uh, satisfy the major public this year during the you know this quarantine um, uh, period the city government decided to you know create some new public spaces and they decided to create an open beach uh, for people to enjoy their uh, you know holiday time without leaving you know without, because they couldn't leave uh, to other countries so they created a, an open beach on the square which raised such a debate about whether it's ethical to uh, you, you know, initiate such kind of activities to uh, make beach parties on a square where uh, you know participants of the uprising in uh, 1863 were killed and tortured. Um, next, very technical aspect. So I mentioned to you already the piece uh, which was performed in the parking lot. Mm, Never it was used for artistic interventions, but you know why not? It has a roof. It's a nice space, and it works well with the play they were um, supposed to show. The theater was supposed to show. No one really was expecting that the uh, weather conditions will turn so bad. And this is my uh, personal video. You know this uh, what is happening during the performance. So the actors are performing. Meantime, the a uh, huge storm is coming, you know, a uh, flood of water, a uh, huge wind, and this is how it ends. Basically, we just, we lost electricity. Uh, these are, you know, the actors trying to save the, the project and <laughs> created a party just on the side. So, you know, um, there are points where you bump into an unexpected, unexpected limitate technical limitations about adjusting uh, to public spaces. Concerning the private spaces, mm, you know, uh, it's not a private space. Let's see, core here is a semi-private space. But then you also have an interest here, many different residents, and sometimes the people didn't like the performances that were brought. Some of them were calling police who were informed, of course, what is happening, but they don't like the content that is being uh, brought to them. And finally, uh, you know, what was not maybe mentioned uh, is about creation of this public spaces. And I, I uh, refer to it in the Vilnius example where they created this open beach, but um, there were also less debatable, uh, let's say, initiatives when the Kona's, uh, Vilnius uh, city municipality also created a kind of an open stage um, during the summer period which could be used by different artistic uh, groups to perform in a public uh, public space an open uh, air space um, we as well as konas ecoc are thinking about uh, you know how we are going to use the public spaces in 22 and are uh, planning now it's a new uh, you know thought in our heads how to create some open air space like a stage so we are also adjusting to this and finally the digital digital shift uh well we were running uh, quite a few digital projects during this uh, pandemic but uh what seems 
Mm, to me, you know, what thoughts um, uh, um, it brought to me is that, it, you know, this pandemic time it really accelerated all the changes. Nothing, I don't think that something completely new happened during this uh, time, you know, concerning the digital space. Uh, but it really accelerated the shift of all institutions, all, you know, uh, different, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, actors of the culture sector suddenly to drop everything and shift to the digital. Um, it's, uh, you know, as uh, Professor Pierluigi Sacco rightly noticed during the Kona Seacock Forum, this created new opportunities, but largely this was a great opportunity for, you know, commercial platforms for tech giants, you know, such as Netflix. And uh, in his opinion, so rephrasing, uh, the, it's very important to have kind of uh, platforms, uh, platforms for independent cultural uh, actors, you know, the uh, platforms where this uh, content could be uh, better promoted and represented. Um, the he also noted and i'm again referring to Kona's uh, ecoc forum about this uh, impact of the digi digital shift on the physical spaces so in his view uh this uh, you know this this really will change the way that our physical institutions look like in a sense that uh, these um, physical spaces are likely to become more more hybrid and you know, they're expected to use more kind of interactive technologies from the audience who are used to that. Finally, for me, um, the accessibility issue um, is becoming quite, became quite clear um, with this digital shift, you know, reading uh, such st statistics like, you know, the fact that 35,000 school students in Lithuania didn't have access to a computer or internet so that they can you know freely participate in the online uh, school education it's just an illustration how you know online um, uh, will not solve uh, the accessibility question for sure and it even creates a bigger challenge for accessibility uh, i suppose so i think that's it from me Thank you. Very good, thank you. The organizers have given us um, the slightly more time so we, we can still have a, a quite a long discussion now afterwards and uh, also take more questions. So uh, we are supposed to end uh, quarter past three. So we have exactly half an hour. Um, but uh, uh, Anna, uh, just actually um, uh, two questions. One was actually asked uh, from Irena, but I think this is, true also for you uh, but also Irena just uh, bear in mind that question and the, and the question was really about the resilience of the city and this adaptability of the citizens to go along with this new situation you already mentioned uh, some of quite provocative ideas and, and, and ideas that might even divide some of the people but still uh, uh, success of that kind of a approach of really uh, going with culture to new spaces and new formats uh, is is not only about the creativity of the of the artist, but also the acceptance um, and playfulness of its citizens. Uh, Tanya from uh, from Maribor actually asked from Irena um, if uh, uh, if you think that the determination of the town's identity. Um, she mentioned Rijeka as a red, as a revolutionary uh, town, uh, helped uh, in the kind of a residents and audiences' response to that new uh, situation. Um, Kaunas, very similar, you know, uh, being the second city uh, uh, fighting for its uh, for its position, fighting for its uh, uh, identity. Uh, do you think, Anna, we start from you, that that kind of a position where the city and its citizens find themselves helped? Um, uh, help you to to be so flexible in these times of crisis. Mm. Thank you, Ragnar. Well, um, we do. You know what I really value. Uh, I'll start from further afar, but I really value from this process the uh, the good consequence of culture institutions and artists uh, coming closer to the local public. So people, you know, who lost 
opportunities to travel for their international tours, which is their you know re- daily life uh, regularly, suddenly um, not only were restricted to travel, but also were encouraged with the you know financial measures, uh, financial uh, programs and the situation to um, to connect with uh, locals more and uh, you know meet their audiences here and get to know their um, expectations their challenges so i think that this uh, uh, this whole situation is bringing us everyone here closer and the culture sector more sensitive to the local public's needs um you know and with the they are more um kind of aware of the of their importance in such uh, a a situation you know uh, their importance in uh, uh, exiting this uh, crisis so in our case uh, the program that we are running this community culture program i told you about is really our uh, kind of our medium uh, with the city and this um, I didn't go very into detail here but we have the whole uh, kind of model worked out of how we work uh, with the local community so it's a very you know uh, process oriented uh, program uh, where we really try to listen in the first stages of of uh, most of our projects we are trying to listen to the needs of the local communities we usually work with lo- local communities of neighborhoods and uh, next uh, we uh, do our best in uh, helping them with artistic measures artistic uh, suggestions to uh, address the topics that they are raising and address their expectations and needs towards maybe improving their environment or their creative uh, kind of um, uh, uh, climate there in, in these neighborhoods. So I think that you know this uh, we are we are trying to be in in a connection in a sensitive connection with the locals. Okay, but Anna, but the same question as I asked Irena. Uh, you are trying to be uh, uh, in in contact with your audiences, with the local communities. You do things, but as you mentioned yourself, you do different things. You do in much smaller scale. Uh, 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 you do less. You do uh, uh, maybe more intimate uh, relationships. You, you might do uh, uh, more digital. So in all doing all of that, how how do you make sure that you engage? Uh, people with special needs, uh, people of minorities, people, uh, people of disadvantaged grouped, uh, groups, uh, uh, people with uh, uh, less economic opportunities. How you make sure that with doing less and doing digital and doing uh, more restricted, that you still have a positive impact on those social groups as well? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, what uh, I think, you know, our insti- it's a quite of a... Uh, ECOC is a, such an example, you know, we have a huge uh, uh, program which has, um, it, it's kind of a, the goal to cover the needs of these different communities and each of our program departments, which is huge by now, are uh, always keeping in mind these uh, interest groups and they are making uh, special projects or uh, they do uh, think about these interest groups in the uh, wider project. Uh, talking about accessibility, for example, we are continuing to uh, develop um, you know, guidelines for accessibility, for example, for culture institutions in Konas and in Lithuania about improving the accessibility of culture. And this continues uh, now also considering the online and uh, different other aspects of the current uh, uh, trends in the culture sector with also with different minorities you know where we have we have um, a festival which is upcoming and it starts october 8 which is focused on ethnic minorities in the city um, and their memory in the city so we work in close connection with them even though the uh, formats of uh, the um, this year's festival are more um, 
kind of, uh, you know, risk proof corona wise. Um, and so I think that this uh, changes of shapes of projects, they don't uh, create obstacles for, uh, for uh, you know, filling uh, in these expectations or needs of different interest groups, but it's just that you need to uh, kind of think it, be mindful of these interests. Okay. Irena, uh, the question was about Rijeka as well. Do you think that your identity, what Rijeka is known for, is very helpful in, in managing some of those uh, uh, challenges uh, uh, come, uh, brought by, by, uh, by COVID? It certainly didn't hurt. I would say that uh, uh, in the first place, I think that being the European Capital of Culture, uh, 2020 was supposed to be our year. There were great expectations, you know, uh, prior to the COVID uh, from, for the whole year from, uh, from our citizens, from uh, our audiences. And uh, I must say, I must admit that uh, when the lockdown happened, we did not start immediately with the programs. It took us some time and some time, a month, let's say, and we were very harshly criticized for that. Uh, people were expecting us to go digital immediately. As I said, it's very difficult, you know, all our contracts were signed, uh, people paid, problems were ready on standby and artists were ready to just go with the, to start the implementation program. So, um, well, as I explained, we, we, we adapted and the summer was, uh, was, was really wonderful. So I would say that people were really uh, hungry for, for, for meetings, for cultural encounters, for, for programs, for, for sharing. And to go back to this, whether digital can replace physical, um, yeah, first of all, I would like to say that uh, in digital space, I think what happened is a lot of quantity, but not necessarily different quality or new originality, new types of creativity. I think that takes time, that takes more reflection. And after that, you know, all this quantity, you know, I, it happened to, to me and I would turn on and then turn off after a few minutes or half an hour, never, uh, I admit it, never uh, viewing uh, <laughs> everything till, till the last moment, you know, till credits to, to, uh, to put it in quotes. So, and, and physical is important because it's not just an experience of an artistic form or expression. It's also a moment of, of uh, uh, being social, of creating social ties, of creating social digital. It's every uh, physical artistic encounter is a social moment. And it's something that builds our communities and builds us as people. And without that, you know, uh, um, I don't know, it's... it's, it's something is missing. So I would say that yes, people, regardless of format uh, or, or setting, they were really uh, eager to participate. We basically, we had complaints that when people were not able to, to join us because we only had 300 slots or only one performance or we could only let uh, 150 people into a certain, uh, certain space. Uh, to, I would also like to comment on, on the question of working with the communities. Um, our, the slogan of our project is Port of Diversity. Rijeka is known as a very diverse city, uh, but we wanted to also put a question mark after that, uh, uh, that, that, that slogan, how, how, we, how we live that diversity, how, how we live together nowadays in new circumstances. And we actually, even before COVID, we uh, developed different uh, platforms, different tools for actively uh, involving our communities and our different diverse groups, from age groups to sex groups to, to, to different uh, uh, people with different challenges or different uh, social situation, different nationalities, different ethnic groups. And um, what we try to do is basically 
to quote from a book that we just published and that is dedicated to that question of diversity, we try to create temporary places of a new sociability. Uh, kitchen is a very good metaphor for that. So you, you mix, you experiment, you spill, you, 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 know, you try, you create, and uh, uh, not the experiment is not always necessarily, uh, I mean, it's good because it happened in the first place. Just experimenting is good, you know, and then the results are, are, are different. And also the whole COVID situations uh, approved how important it is to work with the communities, but in a very, uh, in a way that it's a process, in a way that it's a structure, in a way that uh, you just not, you know, invite everybody, but to develop different tools. And uh, those, a lot of those programs really fill the gaps that we had uh, with uh, high arts, if I may say so, you know, in the in the COVID uh, situation, and people responded to that and identified with those programs uh, a lot. Oh, uh, very good. Uh, actually, a few years uh, ago, um, uh, doing a project, um, we asked uh, uh, a professor uh, from the Professor Peter Kelly uh, from uh, the University of Alto in Helsinki. We asked. Uh, uh, how uh, does a creative space or environment look like? Where should we look if we want an example of creating really a creative and, and space that allows for innovation and experimentation? And he, his answer was very simple. He said, you don't, have to, uh, uh, you don't have to invent such a place. It actually exists. Uh, it's called kindergarten. Um, so just look at how kindergarten works and you, you have all the, uh, the, the ingredients. A question I want to ask from each of you uh, as a round, starting from Irena. Um, and, and actually, I had this written down, but then our listener, uh, Paul from uh, Paul Martin from uh, Philippines, who is actually a uh, student of architecture, asked the same question. So it, it's, it's brilliant. Um, so what we've done so far is that you, you now showcased brilliantly how uh, existing spaces uh, during an ex uh, a, a very sudden uh, restrictions and changes of the environment have made you uh, adapt to the new reality how you are uh, how you are taking those existing places and 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 trying to put them to work in a new conditions but let's think of from now to the future. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Paul asked it in a way that, what would you advise urban planners, architects, designers, environmental planners uh, in this situation looking to the future? Um, um, you, uh, for example, Irena, why I asked to start with you, you also mentioned at the end in your presentation of your big infrastructural uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, plan. Now, this plan was started long before mm -hmm. Any pandemics. How, we, how do we have to rethink uh, uh, spaces when we are planning them now, thinking of the experience we have this year? Yeah. But proven, proven from the experience uh, this year, the space, is, the space that we're, we're talking now about, let, let's start from indoor spaces, the space that worked the best is the big warehouse because it was open space, adaptable uh, space that you can really model to your needs, you know, that, that does not constrict you. Of course, there are certain constrictions, but basically space that works with you, you know, and that is inspirational in that way because you can, uh, you can have one big space or five smaller spaces or uh, it's, big enough to, to host uh, different groups at different times. So I would say that this, uh, this modularity is very important. And also, uh, whether we are talking about indoor or uh, outdoor uh, spaces, um, I, I definitely think that we need elements that invite people to stop, to, to share, to, you know, a cushion on the floor, a piece of wood where you can sit, uh, something that, that's inviting for us to somehow to bring us together. 
you know, I, I once read that, uh, I think it was in uh, an example from Australia, when they were trying to, they, they studied Mediterranean cities and found out that narrow, small streets actually brought people together. So they, they created the small corridors so, so that you can, you cannot, you know, walk uh, uh, five meters away from the other, other pedestrian, but you need to, to, to brush your noses. Of course, this is totally anti-COVID, what I'm, what I'm saying now. But, you know, inviting spaces. Um, also, the, the whole climate question, I think it's, uh, it's something that really, really needs to be taken into consideration. It, takes, it would take us another panel to, to talk about mm -hmm. that. But definitely we can, you know, we, we need to uh, ask, this, this question has to be very important and pertinent when we produce our events and do our uh, things. But just to answer you um, uh, regarding the, our big infrastructural uh, project, yes, it started uh, years ago. Um, it will be home to, to four existing cultural institutions. They will definitely need to, to be uh, adaptable to their audiences uh, within given, uh, given, given new spaces, you know. And one of the most valuable, I think, uh, parts of that whole complex is going to be the big square in the middle, big public square. And I think, and I really hope it's going to be like a, a forum for a uh, model of a forum for, 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 for different needs and different voices. Um, and exclusivity should be avoided, definitely, you know, when talking with accessibility. That, that uh, requires flexibility on both sides, on the organizer's sides and on the audience's side. Very yes. good. Uh, let's move to Nevenka. Nevenka, if you would be asked uh, to give a lecture in the university for the uh, upcoming uh, art, uh, architects and designers and urban planners, what would you tell them for the future? <laughs> well, I, my answer would not be so different from, let's say, before COVID time, but I, I, I believe that uh, artists and cultural workers has a lot uh, of skills and the way of approaching uh, the questions, let's say, which will be very helpful in planning every either building or space uh, and uh, really involvement, the very basic, not to come to the end to decorate, like we usually see also in the cities or for the public spaces, artists come by the end to make something ugly a little bit more acceptable. They call it uh, lipstick on the monkey. Huh? <laughs> so, but how you, how actually you involve artists uh, or cultural workers or even social workers uh, to involve more holistically and really with uh, participatory way, really to to work with people who are using these spaces. There are different different met methods. For example, we in our neighborhood we did an experiment and really we did sociological study of our neighborhood. Uh, and anthropological study, what people would like to have. And at the same time, we were suggesting some solutions because people, when you ask them what they miss, they don't know. Sometimes they say, if you never ate mango, you don't know what mango tastes like. So that's why artists can also propose at the same time. And then you see whether it works, whether people accept, whether people can add something, like add, add its value. That's why I think that in architecture, uh, I say, as my uh, colleague uh, from Japan, Kyohei Sakaguchi said, there is too much of architecture. So sometimes, or another colleague uh, from, from here in our, one of our discussions, he said, also non-architecture, not to do something is also architecture. So not all these public spaces has, const, const, Milan Kosets is his name, not all the public spaces needs to be, to be filled all the time, or not all the old buildings should be restruct, restructed all the time. But also let's really see what can what will we do with these ruins? What is how to, to collaborate together with artists and communities? This is more the, this is definitely what I would suggest to, to 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 the architects and city planners in all the domains to involve artists and the and the, and cultural workers really 
from the scratch when they plan something, mm -hmm. not by the end as ornamentalism. So Anna, from, uh, from your experience, do I understand correctly that when uh, now in the future uh, you, uh, uh, you plan a new uh, uh, living area, uh, then uh, not only a park uh, and not only a children's playground, but a stage should be there in the middle of the houses? Uh, you know, not in the middle of the houses for sure. We wouldn't like to spoil the piece of our residents' uh, daily life. But, you know, we are looking for a public space in the city where this uh, project could be most fitting and, uh, you know, visible as well, accessible, you know. So we are, of course, bumping into some limitations about this pub these public spaces, you know, they weren't, they were planned, they were planned for different Oops. I think something happened with uh, Anna's connection. Yeah, it's Sorry, like, the connection broke up for a second. Yes, you are back. So, so you know, so what? What if I was, you know, beginning to plan a public space now to fit our needs as a cultural producer, for example? So I would dream about a space which is uh, uh, adjustable, multi-purpose. Uh, you know, when you come to one of some of the squares here in Kaunas, you don't have, you, you can't even imagine where this, for example, the stage could be placed in, or where we could imagine the seatings, how we could, um, how we could merge our activity with uh, the representational aspect of the square where all commemorations are taking place. Will it be a conflict or no? So uh, I think that, you know, I hope that we will find some space that can uh, be very adjustable, you know, and serve these different needs and also accessible, which is in our case, I, I'm shocked how it is still um, a repeating problem, you know, the contemporary reconstructions uh, of squares uh, seem to miss uh, some accessibility measures like, you know, stairs don't have um, uh, the, you know, the slides or how you call them for people in wheelchairs or for mother with, uh, uh, with children. So, but also on the other side, you know, except from this uh, uh, event uh, purpose of, of, this, of the public spaces, I also noticed a sudden um, you know, uh, needs for people to go out during this pandemic uh, to find kind of an intimate spot, but still where they could enjoy a breath of uh, fresh air. And suddenly many people appeared in parks. And this, I suppose, is another thing which is, uh, you know, very needed in the cities, not only for uh, our, you know, well-being needs, but also for, you know, better sustainability. Um, I think even speaking about indoor spaces, not only outdoor spaces like public squares, this um, mm, uh, flexibility of the space is a, a very needed uh, feature now, um, and it makes makes the space not only more adjustable to different kinds of regulations during COVID, you know, can be indoors or not, or cannot. The theater, you know, church one day's hospital, the other day used for, um, again, for mass services, but with distanced uh, seatings. Uh, so uh, this, I suppose, you know, this uh, flexibility and of course, creative space, you know, the space has, you know, people want now to be par particip participate, you know, they want to be participants all, you know, in all kinds of ways they have these expectations. So again, this, the modularity of the space, different modes of using it, I think is uh, important. Very good. Let's make a last round uh, very quickly, uh, your key takeaways. And actually, there was one question, it was from somebody anonymous, so I don't know, I can't... Uh, a credit to that uh, listener uh, by name, but um, somebody said uh, it was uh, it was about uh, Rieka's opening, uh, which uh, the um, our listener said was incredible, um, and 
she said, he or she said something uh, uh, very interesting, very intriguing. And I was just thinking, listening all three of you, uh, uh, you described uh, how quickly you all adapted and brought forward new forms of culture, new formats, new projects that would uh, adapt to the new situation. And, and, and we focused on that. But, but then there is so many amazing ideas that were planned, but never realized. So the question was, uh, would there ever, ever be an opportunity to do uh, the undone uh, program? Um, or at least even as a, as a, as a thought game, uh, uh, kind of um, uh, alternative reality uh, uh, or scenario, how would uh, all of your work, both in Bunker or in, in, in Kaunas or in, in Rijeka, looked like if we would not have had um, coronavirus? Irena, would, what thoughts will that... Uh, yeah. yeah, as I said at the beginning, we planned... Uh, Six more than 600 events, you know, huge uh, spectacles on the street, uh, huge festivals, uh, you know, opening of festivals with 10, 20,000 people on the streets. Uh, um, I don't know. At the moment, it's uh, it's unimaginable that that will ever again be possible. I hope it will, but for the moment, it's really difficult. Yeah. To Rijeka 2021. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe we we officially we uh, we were given most probably we will be uh, we will prolong our year. We are waiting for the decision by the parliament. It also depends on the budgets. It's uh, um, it's an exceptional event, uh, but that also uh, you know relies on on heavy budgets that has to be admitted. Our budget for this year was reduced by uh, forty percent on average. Um, but also what is important, what we are trying to do now is to ensure our legacy. And that's very important. And uh, legacy uh, also in terms that certain institutions, certain organizations will continue with the work with certain festivals, with certain platforms, with certain networks. And that's something that uh, for them to build on and to continue, uh, to continue working with artists that maybe couldn't come this year or, uh, yeah, and uh, I, I, I put a lot of hope into that, and uh, I don't think that's that's something that will remain and that uh, won't be lost. Irena, 40% cut in the budget. In 2007, when Iceland was hit by the uh, mm -hmm. economic crisis and the collapse of banks, and I went there, and they had cut everything, every single budget except one, uh, or at least except one, and that was the cultural exports budget. And coming from my country, I was very surprised. I mean, how come you cut everything else but mm -hmm. cultural exports? And the answer was very simple. said, listen, with, uh, with erupting volcanoes and collapsing banks, culture is one of the last good news coming out of this country. So yeah. we would be incredibly stupid cutting that budget. Yeah. How, come, how come in a year where... Rijeka and how come in a year where Croatia could shine as a cultural beacon in, in Europe, um, uh, your budgets are cut 40 percent? Well, it was, uh, I would say it was a domino effect, you know, all public, uh, there were severe public uh, cuts in public budgets for, for different things, you know, and um, also less revenue. Uh, let me give you an example for the local budget. For example, in January and February, the revenue for uh, only for in hotels and restaurants, Rijeka was double compared to 2019. And probably that trend would have continued throughout the year and we would really feel the spillover effect uh, of this project in a very positive way. Uh, but uh, all of a sudden, you know, um, of course, uh, foreign visitors couldn't, uh, I mean, Rijeka is a small city of 130,000 inhabitants and we relied heavily on visitors from the region. We are three hours of driving distance from Milan, from uh, one hour from Trieste, uh, one and a half hour from Ljubljana. So, you know, it's very easy to, to reach us. That, of course, did not happen. 
also sponsors withdrew because their uh, revenues, uh, incomes were cut. So as I said, the domino effect. Um, yeah. So, so think, think uh, Irena, my recommendation, think about the undone program of 2020. Then yeah. people will not come to see uh, the culture capital uh, uh, of Europe, but they will come to see what they all missed. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. There, there's going to be a lot of things, a lot of uh, contemporary art uh, installations, uh, uh, permanent exhibitions that will remain. Um, new museums, so definitely after 2020, there's going to be a lot to 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 taste and to see. Ne yes, thank you, Nevenka. Uh, last words: uh, uh, If we would talk in exactly in a year, uh, in 2021 October, would you be optimistic of the positive changes in Slovenia and in the environment around you? I'm. I think it will take more than that. I think it will be all this what is going on unfortunately i couldn't show you the the, the images i had prepared for you but uh, i think this all this transition not just for slovenia but for everybody will take much more time this is at least my my feeling that because mm -hmm. all the transitions don't happen from day to to another day and everybody thinks it's in transitional time but i think now we definitely are not just in slovenia but all over the world but maybe i was also playing with the you know ljubljana is also candidate uh, for the to become a cultural capital in 25 and my colleagues uh, including me are really strongly working on that and one of the pro projects which i really like is also museum of garbage and it is also something which will be not just garbage physical garbage and all you know do it yourself recycling etc but also how to recycle ideas how to do all these undone things how, and in bunker we have been playing for a long time how to do something where everything that you threw away kind of would bring into another light even if you do a theater project sometimes you find something so fantastic by the by the end of the day you have to throw it because it doesn't fit into ensemble of the things so this is something which is i think very playful and it would be really interesting how to how to work of these undone things unrealized thrown away um uh, smashed away stuff and we we, we might have a festival in 21 of that <laughs> wonderful idea nevenka quickly quickly go and patent that idea quickly <laughs> uh, the uh, museum of broken relationships uh, uh, in croatia has been such a smashing hit around the world so uh, quickly yes. uh, Actually, we have been the first one to invite them in in out of their country and they are my dear friend and now they they are not just collecting the, the objects but also they are collecting the plants so we come uh, so you can really uh, abandoned plants can also uh, or just to keep them over the the holiday times and uh, they, they are fantastic what they do is wow. absolutely and amazing. uh finally anna uh, what what will we expect uh, for 2022? How will we? How would you wow the entire Europe? Thanks, and I love the idea of the gar of the garbage museum. <laughs> it mean? Well, we are uh, preparing for the title year, um, having in mind all these uh, regulations right now, and trying to create a, a risk uh, proof plan you know so uh, such a plan which would um, allow us for example to deliver the grand scale events such as uh, the the title year opening uh, which uh, Riyak has successfully uh, accomplished uh, in different modes uh, one mode if uh, the restrictions don't allow us to gather in a mass crowd and this you know the same event but in a different uh, attendance regulation yeah that uh, you don't uh, okay it might be something more visual than uh, uh, than durational performance you know so something that you can enjoy over a period of time so we do plan uh, the grand events of the year, the January 22nd opening, the May event, which is the opening of the summer season in 22, and the closing event. This, these all events are based on the um, uh, so-called new myth of Kona. So this is our uh, one of the project pillars. We're trying to write together with the local citizens a new narrative of the city, a new myth 
the main character of, or of which is the Kona's Beast, which is the character also of the grand events. So together with the citizens, we're writing stories about connecting different legends that surround the city and connect us with different cultures in Europe. And we're trying to use this narrative for, for planning the grand events. Uh, also, our 64 current partners and new partners to join the program in the next coming months, they are planning to deliver all, uh, you know, events, uh, probably over 300 events that will, that are being planned to also, you know, very adjusted to the, to the needs of the, uh, you know, quarantine regulations. And uh, we still uh, plan to plan to create uh, the festival of modernism lights, you know, so this is, uh, modernism is one of the main narratives of Kona's uh, city. The, this is uh, one of the best places to visit uh, for lovers of modernist architecture. So uh, a huge involvement of local citizens, owners of modernist houses, apartments are ready to let inside their private and semi-private public spaces uh, the artistic projects, artists. So um, the, the visitors of the city can expect to see some modernist apartments uh, uh, activated through artistic interventions, poetry reading, small uh, gatherings in, in private spaces, as well as, uh, you know, facade mappings um, all over the year. Mm. Fantastic. So any, everyone who now has a chance uh, still to go and visit Rijeka, or uh, uh, if it's prolonged the next year as well, then head to Kaunas in 2022. And before you go to Ljubljana 2025, step by Estonia, Tartu 2024. We are going to meet uh, for the next Motovilla uh, session uh, in November. It was such a wonderful to have you all here, and I would like to give the floor back to Ines for the final remarks. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you, Nevenka, Anna, and Irena for joining us, and thank you, Ragnar, for leading this uh, discussion. And hopefully, I, ha I hope we will have less architecture, like you said, Nevenka, and more collaboration in the future. And as Ragnar said, see you on 5th of November for our next discussion. So. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.